ladies and gentlemen, he's here, Saikusen! How are you? Good, thank you. So, you're the master and ruler of the world, former WBF champion, wrestling legend. Did I miss anything out? No, you can keep going. <laughs> um, so, you, you've wrestled everywhere, WBF, WCW, the whole nine yards, but um, you're most, I think most people in the UK know you for the Psycho Sid run that you had. My first question is, do you still feel bad about giving Jose Lothario a heart attack? No, not at all. Um, when you were coming up with your character of Sid, whether it's Sid Justice, Sid Vicious, Psycho Sid, it felt like you really, like you, you became so intense and maniacal when you did that. How did you kind of come up with that character? What was the idea for you to become this absolute psychopath? You talk about the character Psycho yeah, Sid. Yeah. I think one time it was, uh, I was either walking back from the ring or to the ring or I remember the camera being there, and then it just sort of came to me and said, start that blinking thing, you know? And then from there, I said, okay, and I started adding to that. And then I did a lot of reading of, like, horror books. You know, and I, that's where I got my interview material for that, for that particular character. And the, when you had your first run in WWF as Sid Justice, you come in in 91, you're the referee at SummerSlam for Hogan and Warrior against Sergeant Slaughter and uh, General Adnan, and it seemed like you were being positioned to be the next big babyface, the next big Hulk Hogan, um, and then you ended up turning on him and uh, becoming a, the, the heel Sid Justice. There's a lot of stories going out there. Did you want to be the babyface? Did you want to be the heel? What did you want to do, and, and why did it play out the way that it did? That's what I'm trying to think about how to say that, but boring everyone to death. I was offered to come to the WWF and to um, do this character Sid Justice and came to an agreement I was going to only do TVs and pay-per-views for one year and at WrestleMania they'd make me world champion and then say you're the next guy. Actually I called Vince on a telephone I got an opportunity when Dusty Rhodes became the new booker of WCW he came in and said, Sid, I want you to sign a new contract. And uh, so I went home. I never talked to this guy, Vince McMahon, before. I called the office, and in one second, he's on the telephone. And he said, Sid Vicious? I said, Jerry goes, and I told him the situation. And uh, he said, well, I'd like for you to come in. So that afternoon, he had a, a flight for me to his office. So he promised this stuff. I'd do that. So actually, the match you're talking about with uh, the Ultimate Warrior, I, I was... They fired the warrior as soon as he went out to match that night. And then I had to go in and take his place because there was no one else. So that sort of was like the beginning of the starting of a bad, you know, things weren't going like they were supposed to. And then when you um, eventually go to WrestleMania 8 to face Hulk Hogan in the main event, um, do you have fond memories of that match? Um, it doesn't look like you do. Um, talk a little bit about that match and the way that, that played out. Again, this is uh, not your typical, you know, wrestling stories people would probably talk about. Um, when we got to the um, WrestleMania, that's again when I was supposed to be world champion. And I was only then going to go into house shows, never do a house show before then, right? So at the SummerSlam with the Warrior thing, things changed. So what was it where the Royal Rumble, where Ric Flair won the Royal Rumble? I think Albany. It, huh? Albany, yeah. You yeah, Albany, New York. And what happened was, you know, when uh, the deal, I was supposed to either pull Hogan over, no, Hogan pulled me over, you know, uh, people booting. And we went back to the back, and uh, he was really upset to the point I was like, wow. And, uh, he's, and so I went to Vince right then after so many other things that went not the right way. And I stuck my hand out and said, hey, man, I, I'm sorry, but I can't stay here anymore. You know, things aren't going like we were, they were supposed to. And um, when grown people cry like that, I can't be around grown men acting like that. And uh, so he made me a promise to stay till WrestleMania. Then that's when I left after that. Do you think that, do you think Hulk Hogan was too insecure about his position? Or do you think he should have, should he have went with the way the fans were thinking and changed his character? 
You know, to be honest with you, and this is the honest guy's truth, everyone knows me and knows this, this is the truth. I never called the office and asked questions. I never knew who I was working with the next night. And the reason being is like, when I first got in the business, I met a guy in Hillbilly Gym, he goes, Sid, don't take yourself too serious. If they ask you to lose, you know, you want me to do it tripping in the ring, you'll keep your job and you won't have any trouble. So that's why I really looked at the business and I wasn't your typical wrestling protocol. I, I didn't know anything about wrestling. I just f sort of fell into it from um, being so big, you know. But, um, so what was the question again? About Hogan, like, was, was he too insecure, do you think, about everything? I don't know if he, I mean, you would think he'd come across insecure if someone is screaming. Uh, I think he screamed at Vince and said, you did this purposely, you know, like he made those people boo him. <laughs> that, no, this is the thing is people, the business is simple. Uh, like in anything, we're gonna get to a position where we do really well and then things change in the wrestling business and, and everything else in life. And so, and it's, it's part of the struggle for all of us. Again, for me too, not having this dream of being a wrestler and all this, it wasn't as hard for me. So maybe he, I don't say insecure, um, but it was a hard pill to swallow. Say, you know, the warrior didn't do it, and now we're going to get Sid to do it. And, and um, but so it's, for me, he was always a, a gentleman to me and kind, and uh, but it had to be a tough position. And at WrestleMania 8, there's this famous clip that's on YouTube of you screaming at Mean Gene Okerlund and calling him a fat, bald little oaf. Yeah. Um, when you would do those interviews, was he in on it at the time, or was it just kind of like, I'm going to do something and just go with it? You know, in those days, we did everything on the wing. And so what I always tried to do, I always thought I had maybe at any particular time, I'd have five or six characters in my mind from things I was reading, like Hannibal from Silence of the Lambs or, say, Johnny Cash, or sometimes it would be one word or a paragraph that would set off things for me. And so that's where I came up with the interviews that I did. And then you went back to WCW, and it, it always seemed that you would end up being WCW, WWF, WCW, WWF. Why do you think that you jumped so much from place to place? Well, when I went to the WWF the first time, I walked away from, at the time, and I won't say, the largest guaranteed money deal offered in the business. Uh, Vince McMahon offered me one, I think 10 shows for $250 a year and I, I took a chance on myself and so for me again it wasn't about you know being in one place all the time I wanted to push the envelope and I wanted to be the best at this place and the best at that place and, and, um, and now of course we know there was other circumstances again like I said there's this time that you can feel when you're losing that momentum and I never wanted to do that and if people think about my career, I never was, I never had like some, and I'm not saying anything wrong with this, but some guys only had like one break. My whole career was a break because everywhere I went to was a new deal, it was a big beginning. And to me, uh, I didn't plan it like that, but I'm glad it worked out like that. And when you went back to WBF, you became Shawn Michaels' bodyguard and you're doing all that stuff. Um, again, that was kind of a short run. Um, did you like that idea? How was it pitched to you that you were going to be the bodyguard? And do you think it had more legs to it than it had? It had been pitched to me before, uh, you, know, you know, Vince called me, I was, flew in, we talked about it. Uh, I didn't think it was, uh, you know, I think at the first show at WrestleMania, when you're working against the grain, if you're fighting against something that's not working, it's going to be a struggle. And if I'm standing ringside where the other two guys are in the ring, and they're chanting my name, and they're wanting me to be the bodyguard, that doesn't work. And so I think, and I don't know this, but the night after that, they changed that, if you remember. I think that's hard for someone to be in the ring and someone to be outside the ring and them chanting your name and not the other person. But then the next year you would come back and have one of your big runs where you finally became WBF champion. You have the run where you and Sean are on the same side, and then you get the title shot and it leads to Survivor Series. And it's funny because before, at the Royal Rumble, Hogan's getting booed and he's supposed to be cheered. And then you go to Survivor Series against Shawn Michaels, who's supposed to be cheered, and then gets booed. Um, talk a little bit about that Survivor Series match winning your first championship. Now, 
this is some of the things when you ask me about what happened when I went here or there. I actually, when I was doing the cycle seat in the beginning, and I took that little time off, I had broken my neck, and the doctor said, one more serious blow and you'll be paralyzed. So I took a year off. This is a funny story. I took an agriculture job because I'm a farmer from back, my background. And I never told Vince I, you know, that I'd quit because he was sending me a check every week. True story. And then one day I come home from a convention and he calls and says, again, you need to take the place of the ultimate warrior. And so um, that's what I did. So when I came back, I'd actually come back from an injury that I'd been, you know, that was, and then I got, went to a doctor, got the okay. And that's when I came back. And then um, with the time was asking in, things have changed. The ratings will show. And I think this is a, people won't understand this, but they actually said that the, it showed from like the Saturday night skit was Chris Farley that the new uh, audience was a 1545 male audience that things changed to where now, like you said, I was cheered as a bad guy. <clears throat> so one night I could work with a bad guy and the next I could work with a good guy. So that was the first time that was ever done. What are your memories of that Survivor Series night against Shawn Michaels? You win your first world title in Madison Square Garden. The story for me is the biggest part of that was this, is actually that's supposed to have been Vader in that position. And we were at a garden show a couple months before, maybe four or five months before the pay-per-view, and they said, Sid, we want you to put Vader over because he's going to beat Sean at the pay-per-view at SummerSlam for the championship. And I should, sure, you know, I don't mind. So we left that night as I'm walking through the, the, um, the curtains there, I saw Vince McMahon and I could look at his face and I know he changed his mind on that. So when they pulled me in the office at the next pay-per-view, he said, we're going to make you the champ. I said, I already knew that. And so that to me was the big payoff that I really worked myself in that position. I think everybody know I'm not really liked that well by Vince. So get someone that doesn't like you that well, put you in that position, and then you force yourself to be successful. To me, that was greater than any belt or anything I could have accomplished. And then you would go into the Royal Rumble in 1997 in Texas to in Sean's hometown. He's going to win the title back. And you went from being this really popular babyface to then being hated because you were power bombing his, you know, Jose's son, and you were hitting Jose with a camera. Was that something that you wanted to do and make sure you were disliked? No. Um, again, I was playing that character in between when they said, okay, we're going to put the belt on you tonight. We'll put it on Sean. You know, his big dream was have a, um, what we call like a big show where you have a, a dome that'll seat 60, 70,000 people. And usually that's held for only WrestleMania. So he wanted that. That was sort of a dream for him. So I said, that's what we're going to do. And I said, okay, that's fine with me. So they said, we're going to have you hit Jose Lothario tonight with the camera. And I said, that's like the stupidest thing I ever heard. I said, let me beat Sean with my finish. And in San Antonio, he could beat me with his finish. But they wanted to do it like that, and I did it the way they did. Now, the deal with Sean was, in between that pay-per-view and the next pay-per-view, now, you got to realize business wasn't that good then. And as soon as they put the belt on me, they're selling out every night. So we go to a convention they call Nappy where like venues like this come and you know, tell you what their products are, it's seats or uh, refrigeration or whatever they, you know, all the things they have in these big venues. And I asked Vince that day, I said, business is doing pretty good right now. Are we gonna keep the, still put the belt on Sean? He said, we're gonna put it on him and then we're gonna put it back on you Monday night. And then we all know Sean retired. And, um, but it did lead to you winning the title back and you, you go to WrestleMania against Undertaker. Is that, like, is that one of your favorite memories, going, being in the main event at WrestleMania with Taker for the title? You know, the thing, and I tell people this too, I have a total different perspective of this business than anybody you're ever going to meet. When I was in the first WrestleMania, I was told like a year after, you remember, remember WrestleMania? I went, not really. And I, and I say that as, as a, in a different way. I, was, I took every night seriously, you know, as it was a WrestleMania. And, uh, and I took WrestleMania 13 series too, but to say that it was any greater of a night, it wasn't. The funniest, greatest night of my life was, and people don't remember this, but I was actually five-time champion. I was the first-time champion for 30 seconds against Sting at Halloween Havoc. 
The thing was is no one told me about it. And they came to me and said, tonight you're going to fight Sting. And they told me for three months I'd be the champ. And they said, you're going to take Sting, take him through a door. And when you go back, Barry Windham is going to come back dressed as Sting. He's taken off three months, lost 80 pounds. You just roll him up, you're the new champ. And I'm going, <laughs> okay. And so I, no, I didn't know Barry was coming. So Barry comes in with his head ducked down. He goes, just roll me up, kid. So I rolled him up, one, two, three. He you know, went back to the deal. I took the belt, turned towards the camera like that. I also heard this roar. I turned around, Sting's back in the ring. The referee's pulling the belt out of my hand. He says, take the Stinger splash. Now, why that was more important to me is because I think if in wrestling, and I think wrestling fans will agree to this, if I can fool you, then you feel like something really happened to you that night. And we in the wrestling business feel if we can fool the boys, then we fool the audience. And I was definitely fooled that night. We're going to take some fan questions in just a second. Uh, but before we do, you, you left WBF in 97 and then you went to WCW. You were the Millennium Man. You and Randy Savage. I mean, what a pairing that was. Um, but, and then obviously you would have these promos. Like there's the famous one on YouTube about you have half the brain that I am and I have half the brain that you do with Hall and Nash that's on there. Go ahead. I mean, please defend that one. Go ahead. This is the thing, guys. You gotta realize is um, I consider I did a decent interview in my life. So Vince Russo and Ed Ferrara comes in and Bill Bush is the new guy in charge. He says, Sid, we need to do, get you to do what these guys ask you to do because if you do it, everyone will follow what you're doing. Yeah, right? And so uh, they came to me with that interview. Now, you don't realize this is my home state. They're chanting Suey Pig for Arkansas. And then when they gave me that interview, I asked them, are you really kidding me? And it wasn't really that simple, was it? You had the half their brain. It was like, you are the half a brain. I am. You are the half a brain or something. Crazy. I went, I can't even say that, you know? And so that's, uh, that was the writing for Vince Russo and Ed Farrar. I will never take the credit for that interview. Nor should you ever. Um, okay, we've got. So, if there's any, any questions for Sid, put your hands up. We've got people. We've got a mic around. Give us your name, where you're from. Uh, hello, Sid. How you doing? Pav from Slough down in London. Nice to meet you. Pleasure. Um, one thing I want to say is that like, obviously the most cringing video on YouTube that you have to watch, but you don't want to watch, but this is one of the things you have to see, is this when obviously, when you broke your leg, um, jumping from the top rope. So I just want to know, from that time, um, did you ever try that move before or anything, or, and then what was going on in your head afterwards? Because it was, you know, cataclysmic, so. The thing was, <clears throat> WCW was within months of folding. Um, they give a guy who maybe might turn out to be maybe one of the dumbest people in the world, Johnny Laurinaitis. They gave him like a one-day position to be the, like the booker, the guy that came up with ideas. So he thought, with well, Scott Steiner, if you watched him, if he took a high boot in the corner, he took it really well. It looked like it could. And he, and he really did run his face into your foot really hard. So Johnny says, we're going to do something really crazy. We're going to get you to jump off the second rope and give Scott a high knee. Now, the deal was I was still recovering from total shoulder surgery. I couldn't really support myself. And I told him I didn't feel comfortable doing that. Well, he tells me, we've already got it written down. It's already with the, in the back. Um, we can't get out of it. So two or three different times I, I came to him through the day and said, I just don't feel comfortable with that. And so they, they just wouldn't bend. And so what happened when I jumped, if you notice, Scott didn't, he stopped coming in. When he stopped it, I'm not going to hang up there for very long. Um, so I had to make a decision. I'm going to land on my left leg and I'm going to give him a knee to the head. And what happened, what I feel like, I've never watched the video, I think I came down at an angle. And when I came in at that angle, it was just enough to snap that part of the leg. I, and, and I've never seen the video. Thanks. Um, obviously, you were part of the Shockmaster segment 
Um, what was going through your head at the time? Uh, obviously, the hilarity gets us, but this is you're being funny, part of it. If you, if you listen to the audio when that happened, earlier that day we go through the um, rehearsal and um, Fred is uh, the shock master. And it was, um, this is, we're going, it's going to be a wall here and Fred's going to come through the wall and we practiced a couple times. And it was me and Harlem Heat, I believe. And um, there was a two by four still on the floor. And I said, couldn't you get one of the, the construction guys to remove this two by four? I said, because Fred is going to have a thing on his head. And he's not going to be able to see anything. He said, Sid, you don't know anything. I said, okay. So as soon as that happened that night, you can vaguely hear me back. And I think I was cursing. I said, I told you that shit was going to happen. And uh, it did. So that's what happened, unfortunately, for Fred that night. Oh, the shock master. Um, any more questions? Oh, hi, I'm Paul from Preston. Um, a lot has been said about the finish of WrestleMania 8. Um, how was that supposed to have played out? And was it true that Papa Shango missed his cue? You no, know, I don't remember about Papa Shango missing the cue. I, I told you, in all, I think I said what happened in Albany after Hogan was upset about everything. I, I told Vince that night I wanted to, I was done. Uh, from the beginning, things weren't going the way things were sp supposed to. Uh, I offered him a handshake. He refused my handshake. And so I said, well, I'm still quitting, you know. So he said, well, stay till WrestleMania. So everything after my and Hogan's match, I knew nothing about. Hi, Sid. Uh, my name is Jonathan from Limerick, Ireland. Um, I was a huge fan of yours. Hopefully we'll see you in the WWE Hall of Fame one day. Um, my question is, what's your favorite version of your character, the Sid Justice, Psycho Sid, Sid Vicious, and is there any guy that you didn't get to wrestle that you really would have liked to? No, I, not for the wrestling part. I wrestled, I got to wrestle with Harley. To me, he's one of the greatest, so you got, I got to be a teammate of Ric Flair, another greatest, um, against Shine Michael, so I don't think I missed anything. I, my two favorite people were Bam Bam Bigelow and Vader. Uh, they were maybe the two biggest workhorses in the wrestling business. Enjoyed working every night. If you guys want a Vader story, I'll give you one. We were wrestling every night. We're doing a match. And so I called a silly spot out of the blue. I said, I'm going to kick you in the stomach and do a sunset flip, which looked stupid for me. I said, and you just land on top of my head and keep your, continue your heat. So we get back to the dressing room, and Leon says, Sid? Did I work like a, like a dog to make you look like a million dollars every night? I said, yeah, Leon, Leon, you do really work hard. You do make me look like a million dollars every night. He goes, well, what was that deal tonight? I said, I don't know. I thought I'd do that. He goes, listen, don't ever do that again. <laughs> Take a couple more questions. Uh Hello, my name's Sonny. I'm from Liverpool. Um, out of the current roster, who will be your dream opponent? Of all wrestlers, who would be my dream opponent? Roster. Out of the current roster now. Anyone right now? And I'm going to be honest about this. I can't really, no one's, I mean. I think, I think you should um, go against Braun Strowman. No, I was yeah. thinking you were going to think that too. And I think that would be a good matchup because people don't get to see big guys go against big guys very much anymore. Also, I will say this, no. Of who's wrestling today, I think I would have a good match with Brock Lesnar. We both do a few things similar. So that's who I think I would work today. Thank you for jogging my memory. I feel like the promos between you and Brock Lesnar would just be dynamite. Um, let's do one last question, if anybody's got one. Anyone? Look. Um, my, my name is Oscar, and I'm from Liverpool. Um, out of your whole career, what was your best match? P 
Probably one of my best matches was with uh, Shawn Michaels at the uh, Survivor Series. And uh, again, reason that is so magical, we were at the Madison, Madison Square Garden, and if people don't know that, that's the uh, ultimate place to ever perform in anything. <clears throat> um, and then Sean is a very giving person in the ring. He, he worked really hard to make me look really well that night. And the response I got from the people, and this is one thing I, I said earlier tonight, that I don't have your typical wrestling career. I didn't come up as a wrestling fan. But no one appreciates the people more than I ever did. Because when people would do that for me without the, the, the machine forcing you to do that, tells me you, you liked something I did. And I appreciate that more than anything. So one more question, no pressure, make it good. Hi, Sid, my name's Arjun, I'm from Slough. Your promos were some of the best in history. I wanna ask, you know when you went from quiet and then you just went intensity in one minute, just, just like that, like a snap of the finger. Did someone tell you to do a promo like that, or was that just you going for it? You know, again, when, um, for my interviews, I, like, again, I, I read a lot of different type of materials. When you read different type of materials, when you read a book really well, like sometimes I'd read a book, me and my wife would go to the theater, and I'd go, have I seen this movie before? She goes, no, this is the first time it being out. So a book, you can almost hear the screaming or the silence of it. So I thought that captured me. In a, in a, reading a book one day, and so I said, that might work, and as soon as I did it, someone said, man, that works. And I get people asking me that all the time. So, and then I looked at also, this is, might be a little off the cuff, Billy Graham was uh, an evangelist at one time. When he got really quiet, you really listened to him. And I thought, okay, that works. So if it works for him, it might work for me as well. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, please give out one more time for the one and only Psycho Sids!